excuse me, little dog. Hi, right, guys. It is a lovely moonlit, soon to be frosty evening here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at Bugs in a Jar Farm here on this lovely. It is a Tuesday night, November 8th, 2022, Tuesday night. Good Lord, trying to dodge all the dog and pony shows uh, going on and all around the planet. Good Lord. <laughs> Everywhere I turn, it is another dog and pony show. Another blah, blah, blah. Another civil war brewing and the doom and gloom and everything else. So, uh, pawing through the mainstream media here in the middle of all of these various dog and pony shows, which I cannot bring myself to attend to. Uh, and unbelievably, here in the Financial Times, I have no idea why this story, which obviously, I mean, it's not a spoiler alert, obviously this article uh, getting a grand total on a planet of 8 billion people, zero comments. Zero comments. Not one human being on the planet. I'm not sure if I'm not the only person on the planet who read this article. And again, why the Financial Times would be publishing it. But uh, this article right here has every bit as much to do with the collapse of a planet than any of the dog and pony shows going on. And this is uh, my never-ending my never-ending futile attempt to explain the difference between planet nibbling and planet eating. Okay, uh, once again, a, a planet eater is like a, you, you know, a white tail buck, a 200-pound white tail buck getting into your beautiful organic garden and leveling it in one night. We all know about the planet eaters, the big blue mini planet eaters, but then there are the planet nibblers, which I liken to the aphids in your garden. While one aphid is not going to have the, quote, carbon emissions is the new one. Uh, you know, so one aphid does not have the carbon emissions of a white-tailed buck. You know, a hundred thousand aphids can do as much damage to your garden, to your planet, as one white-tailed buck in your garden might take a little bit longer to do it. So this is Planet Nibblers, and, uh, which of course ties directly into the O word. Not sure you're ever going to hear the O word anywhere in this story from the Financial Times, although it is certainly looming in the background. and. Uh, Manga Bay talks about this story. Uh, they, you know, maybe three or four times a year, Manga Bay uh, brings this story up. And we're going to talk about charcoal, the exciting subject of charcoal taking down a planet particularly taking down sub-Saharan Africa, where this has, this story has nothing to do with planet eaters. It has nothing to do with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. 
It has nothing to do with big oil, uh, you know, blowing up, what is it, Virunga National Park. This story has nothing to do with, uh, what is it, uh, coal tan mining. Uh, what this is a story about is how planet nibblers, when you have too many people living, you know, beyond the carrying capacity of a landscape, this is overshoot. Okay, where these people in this story do not, quote, have a global impact with their lifestyle and uh, I won't say consumer choices, because they can't consume anything, but their lifestyle choice to breed, of course, is the one we're talking about. Uh, anyway, for those of you still struggling with the concept, let's hear how too many people living beyond their, com their carrying capacity living in overshoot with no help from the rest of the world will take down, at least in this story, a continent, and that of course is the continent of Africa. Okay, we can take it away. Financial Times. <clears throat> Appetite for charcoal threatens the lungs of Africa. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> in the central market of Ambovambe, a provincial capital in southern Madagascar, traders squat on the ground in front of heaps of charcoal. In towns and cities across the island, charcoal is the favored cooking fuel valued for its intense heat and slow burning properties. And that is why in what remains of the forest of Madagascar's drought prone south, several hours walk from the denuded landscape next to the main road, people scratch out a living by chopping down trees and burning them to produce charcoal briquettes. Though much of the trade is illegal and it is blamed for the country's rampant deforestation and soil degradation, charcoal <coughs> is still openly sold by the roadside and in towns and cities in more rural areas the preferred cooking fuel is, take a wild guess, firewood. They don't even have the middleman of charcoal. They just go straight, burn down the tree, cut down the tree, throw it directly uh, in, in the fire. And strangely enough, it never talks about it in this story, but I'm pretty sure that I've read in these Manga Bay reports about the charcoal trade that it is charcoal. It is local people trying to feed, just trying to feed their families. Trying to feed their families. It is the charcoal, and I would probably say firewood thrown in there, the charcoal slash firewood assault on Africa's forest is, is, I believe, is the single leading cause of deforestation in Africa, which of course is another way of saying that overpopulation is the leading cause of deforestation in Africa. Overpopulation is the reason for the bushmeat trade in Africa. Overpopulation is the reason that what 22 million people are starving in the Horn of Africa. 
But anyway, I'm getting off topic of this excellent article that not one person on the planet gives a damn about. <clears throat> okay. The effects on the landscape have been dramatic. This is Silahara Monja. Yes. Explain this to us. Silahala Monja. Before we were born, there were forests here when our grandfathers were children, said Silahara Monja, surveying the parched red earth that, in years of little rain, struggles to produce a crop. Quote, but they cut them all down back then, he explains, adding that the lack of trees had contributed to the vicious dust storms that blight the region. In cities throughout much of Africa, where nearly half of the rapidly growing population now lives, charcoal is the main cooking fuel. Only the wealthiest people use gas or electricity. Akinwumi Adesina, Akinwumi Adesina, president of the African Development Bank. What the hell does an African Development Bank look like? Anyway, was once surprised, was once surprised when visiting Malawi in East Africa to see bicycle after bicycle and truck after truck loaded with charcoal driving to the capital. Quote, I asked the Minister of Energy, how long do you think it's going to take for us to have no forest left in Malawi? Yes, I thought he was going to say 10 years. He said three years. It would be nice to know what year this conversation took place. Now, if I was the reporter or the editor of this story, I might say, what year did this conversation take place? But apparently, no one thought of that at the Financial Times. Anyway, if deforestation is a regional problem for countries like Malawi and Madagascar, it is a planetary threat in Central Africa, home to the Congo Basin Rainforest, the world's largest forest forestry system after the Amazon, sometimes referred to as the lungs of Africa, the rainforest, which covers at least 240 million hectares, 240 million hectares, that's over 500 million acres, forms a carbon sink. You know, it sucks, you know, this really does suck carbon out of the air forms a carbon sink equivalent to six years of global carbon emissions. Those forests, here we go, I would love to get down in between the line, read, you know, find out the truth between the, the lines of this sentence, of this paragraph. Uh, I am hitting the BS detected button, but you know, everything is relative in the world. So, speaking relatively, this prob there probably is a tiny kernel of truth in this hilarious paragraph coming up. Those forests are relatively well preserved in Gabon, Gabon, a net absorber of carbon. 
whose forests sequester about one-third of the carbon each year that France emits. Gabon is relatively wealthy. <laughs> there you go. I just said, you know, everything is relative. So Gabon is relatively wealthy, you know, compared to the Congo or Madagascar. You know, it's a pretty low bar to be relatively wealthy in Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? Uh, I would probably be uh, the Donald Trump or the Elon Musk of Gabon if I showed up there with my $800 a month social security check. Anyway, I'm getting off topic again. Gabon is relatively wealthy and thinly populated. Relatively wealthy and thinly populated with a population of 2 million in a country roughly the size of Britain. Unusually, most people, you know, in Gabon use gas to cook, not charcoal, and the biggest knee slapper of the paragraph, and laws against logging in Gabon are relatively, here's that word again, relatively strict. Again, relative to Madagascar or the Democratic Republic of Congo, a strict logging law. <laughs> oh God, relatively speaking. Uh, anyway, but moving on. <coughs> let's move on. Get, let's get the hell out of Gabon. I don't know why they stopped in Gabon. Anyway, let's get to the nitty gritty here. But in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a much bigger and poorer country of 90 million, 90 million people, not 2 million people, 90, 90 million people, the rate of deforestation has now reached nearly 500,000 hectares that's otherwise known as 1,250,000 acres. What's that? Maybe the size of Yellowstone National Park uh, being chopped down in the Congo rainforest every year now. That's according to Global Forest Watch. In many African countries, including the DRC, deforestation rather than energy production for electricity or industry is now the biggest cause of carbon emissions. According to calculations by McKinsey, whoever McKinsey is, at least 40 percent of Africa's carbon emissions are the result of human-induced land use, such as for settlements and agriculture and changes in land use, to which deforestation is a major contributor. In a report, which they have a link to if you go on this article, McKinsey, whoever McKinsey is, wrote, quote, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where more than 950 million, nine, let's call it one billion people, more than 950 million, we're getting damn close to one billion people rely on wood and charcoal for cooking, a number that is expected to reach one point seven billion people, one point seven billion people by 2050 relying on wood and charcoal for cooking, and fifty 
percent of residential emissions are from cooking, a shift to clean cooking could be transformational. Close quote. Yes. <clears throat> the destruction of forests for charcoal and firewood is not just a direct source of carbon emissions. It also endangers rain patterns that are regulated by forest systems and leads to loss of topsoil as happened in parts of Madagascar. Yeah, like 95% of Madagascar. Moreover, charcoal is dangerous to those who use it. The ADB, I guess that's the African Development Bank, estimates that some 300,000 women and 300,000 children die each year from inhaling damaging particles from charcoal, says Adel. You know, well, you know, every cloud does have a silver lining, as they say. So, you know, uh, it's not all bad news. See how much trouble I get in for that. The ADB. The ADB. Okay, now, okay, now I find out. Now we take a, now obviously, so this is why Financial Times is covering this story. The African Development Bank is now supporting private equity funds such as Spark. Here is Spark that invest in projects to replace charcoal with biomass. Okay. We have charcoal. Let's replace charcoal and firewood with biomass. Replace charcoal with biomass. That's kind of like replacing kangaroos with wallabies. It doesn't make any sense. Call it biomass and you get a grant from the African Development. You get a loan from the African Development Bank. There you go. Replace charcoal with biomass. Biogas. Biomass and biogas. Ethanol and of course liquid petroleum gas cooking fuel. Yes. However, Adesina and others complain that Western banks, including development finance institutions, are reluctant to fund LPG pro projects because of Western government bans on supporting fossil fuel investments. Quote, what we don't talk about but should talk about is overpopulation he says. That was, that was a joke. That was called Doomer Humor. Okay, I assure you some dude from the African Development Bank does not have the word overpopulation, does not have the word overshoot, the words carrying capacity anywhere in his vocabulary. Anyway, obviously that was a that was a an attempt at ironic humor. All right. What we don't talk about but should talk about is avoided emissions. If I am using gas, meaning if I am using fossil fuels for cooking, I am avoiding having to cut down trees. Close quote. Okay. A new crop of companies, including Coco Networks and Stitching and Stitching Modern Cooking, are seeking to develop alternatives to charcoal. Some 
like Kenya-based burn manufacturing, I love it, burn manufacturing, have developed stoves that still use charcoal, but burn it more slowly. Yes, Coco's solution is more radical. It supplies ethanol cooking fuel to poor urban households in East Africa, cutting out the need for charcoal altogether. It makes, here we go, <laughs> anybody who does not understand the sick, twisted humor and what I'm getting ready to say, obviously, is not paying attention. All right, so Cocoa's solution uh, is to supply ethanol cooking fuel to poor urban households. It makes a profit by selling the resulting carbon credits for avoided emissions. I had a rant recently about this absolute unadulterated horseshit. Uh, these carbon credits. Uh, you, you know, that uh, some uh, big ass, you know, real life planet eater, some multinational corporation can go right on about raping and pillaging and eating the planet and claiming that it's buying carbon credits for avoided emissions by some bullshit uh, scam going on over there in East Africa. Uh, the editors of Financial Times know damn well this is bullshit. Everything in that paragraph is bullshit. I know it. Sancho knows it. Cut the crap. Alright, we're going to end up in Gabon. You know, when you have to look uh, for a, <laughs> a happy ending, a, a happy ending in Sub-Saharan Africa, it, it's a stretch to find a happy ending. So you go to Gabon. You, it, yes, you know, when you find yourself uh, in Gabon looking for optimism for the future of Sub-Saharan Africa, you really have to have a sick, twisted, ironic sense of humor. Anyway, Lee White, no comment, Lee White, Gabon's environment minister, argues that the gas widely used for cooking in his country may be the most practical solution at least in the medium term. Quoting Gabon's environment minister. That's like Sancho Panza being New York's chipmunk minister. Yes, quote, until we have affordable, widely available, renewable energy for cooking, then gas is probably the best transition fuel it solves the deforestation and the health issues related to charcoal and may result in decreased emissions. There you go. Yes, fossil fuels. The Financial Times cheering on fossil fuels as a solution to the charcoal problem. Uh, you know, guys, uh, the, the Congo rainforest, kiss it goodbye. Uh, there will be no Congo rainforest remaining in the year 2050. It will be gone. It will be obliterated off the face of the planet. 
It is a combination of planet eaters and planet nibblers um, going into the Congo rainforest, which is the second biggest rainforest on the planet, getting virtually zero press. Nobody talking about uh, all of the shit going down in the Congo rainforest. Uh, you know, while the Amazon, uh, rightfully on some ways, gets all the attention, nobody is talking about the Congo rainforest. As evidenced by the fact that there are zero uh, comments on this story, not even Humpty Dumpty. You know, even that dude Humpty Dumpty uh, did, did not have a comment to make uh, on this story. Uh, nobody gives a shit about what is going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. Nobody cares. Nobody gives a damn that 22 million people are facing starvation. Nobody gives a damn that their computers and their cell phones are, you know, uh, fueling resource wars and uh, killing children. And, uh, you know, nobody gives a damn about Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, and as nobody gives a damn, we're going to sit back and watch every single forest in Sub-Saharan Africa be obliterated off the face of the planet. We're going to watch every single fellow Earthling that humans in Africa share the planet with be obliterated off the face of the planet. And there's nothing anybody is going to do to stop it. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the poster child of what this planet uh, is moving into. It, 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 it is a tragedy. It is a crime. And we all know the reason for what is going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, Jesus. Anyway, that was my dog and pony show avoidance attempt tonight. But I realize I am talking to myself. So uh, I'm going to go over to Netflix and watch a documentary about female orgasm. Since I will never personally witness a female orgasm again uh, uh, until the day I die, maybe I can go to Netflix and watch a female orgasm since a hell of a lot more people are interested in that subject than in the obliteration of an entire continent. Get out there and enjoy your female orgasms while you still can. Back to your dog and pony show now. Bye guys! Yes, little dog. What do you think about what do you think about sub-Saharan Africa being obliterated off the face of a planet, Sancho Panza? That's what I thought. Bye, guys.